So hello, Ooh. and welcome. Welcome to the fall 2017 Gudger Celebration of First Year Writing Presentations. Um, it's really exciting to see this many people here to celebrate the work that you guys have been doing all semester long. Um, and this is really, really pretty amazing. Just a couple of um, reminders before we start. I think everybody's heard me say this 6,000 times, but please sign in on one of the sign-in sheets. There are about eight of them up there. Um, just so that your um, Lang120 professor will know that you were here in case you were getting any kind of incentive for being here. Um, also, make sure to stay until the end of the first session. There will be a couple of door prizes at the end, um, so make sure you stay for that. Also, if you are presenting and have not yet signed a release form, I'm gonna leave it right up here on the podium. If you can make sure that either before or after you present, you sign, that'll enable us to showcase this fabulous work on our website, okay? I just wanna make sure that that's okay with you, that you give us your permission to do that. Also, just a couple of notes. This will be filmed, obviously, as you can see. And so you want to make sure, as, as I'm trying to do right now, that you're speaking into the microphone, OK? Um, if there's a group of you, you need to make sure that you're pretty close to the microphone, OK? And if one of you is going to speak and then another one, just step up to the microphone, and then you can step back. Um, what we don't want is anybody way back here, OK? Uh, because then we're not necessarily going to get in the shot or in the uh, or on the on the audio. So now it is my pleasure to introduce um, the director of the writing program, uh, Dr. G. James, and she's going to tell us a little bit about how this event got started. Um, so please help me in welcoming. Wait up! One more thing. When you get up here, I'm so sorry. I am not going to come up every time and introduce you um, because that would just take too much time. Um, so please introduce yourself, let us know your name and the name of your presentation before you begin. After your presentation, you'll have five minutes. We'll just open it up for questions for five minutes, and you'll get a signal from me from the back when your five minutes is up, okay? So now it is my pleasure to introduce the director of our writing program here at UNCA, um, Dr. D. James, thank you so much. Good evening. It's a delight to have you all here. Um, some of you know, but some of you don't know that I am also an alum. So I was a freshman writer and at UNCA, and then I came back to teach, and I've been teaching here for a minute, for a little while. Um, Early in my teaching career, the, one, of the, one of the people that I had had as a professor um, in, when I was an undergraduate, Peggy Jo Gudger, uh, was a faculty member here, and she taught first year writing her whole career. Peggy began to say to us that there was so much wonderful work that went on in those classes, and that it just really bothered her that we, at the end of the day, the teachers and the students knew about that work, but that other people didn't know about that work. So she wanted students to know what wonderful work was going on across the board. She wanted other faculty members and other people to know about that work. So the first Gudger celebration and the subsequent ones were funded by Peggy Jo Gudger. She has since passed on, but she's left us with this legacy of celebration of the hard work. We know, those of us who teach you, believe it or not, that you work really, really hard in our classes, that we are pretty demanding, that you do all kinds of things that are sometimes difficult and challenging for you, and sometimes without the result that you most hope for. But tonight, we are here to celebrate people's achievement, not just the individuals who stand before you, but our achievement as a collective, because I guarantee you that the teachers who work with you also work hard. I'm very, very happy to be in this spot to celebrate Peggy Jo's legacy and to welcome you to the Gudger celebration. Okay. 
Hello everybody, my name is Mary Steinbrecher, and for my genre analysis project, I decided to explore what makes up good writing in the music theory discourse community. To do this, I read three different academic articles within the music theory discourse community, and I decided to interview a couple faculty members. So, the first thing that I was very concerned with when starting this project is what exactly is the music theory discourse community? So I decided to interview Dr. Brian Felix and Dr. Christine Boone, who are not only professors of our department, but also have written um, published articles within the music theory community and are very knowledgeable on the subject. From my research from reading the three articles and my interviews, I found that there was two main things that constituted good writing within the music theory discourse community. The first was the use of vocabulary. So just like in every academic discipline, the music theory dis discipline follows suit with its own um, genre sp specific vocabulary. So that vocabulary ranges from more commonly known things like notes, chords, and time signatures, which one might know if they play an instrument or were in high school band. But once you get more into the academic community and you start actually reading music theory discourse community papers, it is understood that one would know what things like tonality is, 64th notes or semi hemi demi semi quaver and what things like this are, which is actually a spiral array. So, along with their use of genre-specific um, vocabulary, the other main thing that I found was their use of evidence. Usually evidence in the music theory community is in the form of sheet music. And this follows suit with um, one of the articles I read by Kleppinger. So this is an example from his article, and he says, the vocal melody descends through 151 and E flat, reflecting its text bending from the sky. So in the music theory community, it is understood that one would know how to read music before they would be going in to read this article. So it's very interesting that he would explicitly say, like state the obvious, because if you can read music, you would be able to understand that that is exactly what it is within that key. But Kleppinger does this in order to translate this into words to be able to connect two very different ideas together. And it makes it easier for one to see what would not be just the obvious of reading the sheet music. So when music theorists are writing about um, pieces or topics that don't have sheet music, they have to be a little creative. Sometimes they will make their own transcriptions, meaning they will listen to a piece and they will actually write out the sheet music for it. Um, but when that doesn't make sense, they will do other things, like they will create graphs and they will create tables. Not that type of table, but this type. So in Osborne's article that I read, he talks about this um, idea called terminally climactic forms. So he, what he could have done is transcribed out this song, which is a dashboard confessional song, and had pages and pages of sheet music and going through and marking each place. But it made more sense to make it a table to clearly show his idea of form since it wasn't about the little nitty gritty notes, it was more about the overarching form. So, as a whole, from doing my project, I found that one, when one wants to talk about an abstract topic or something that's a little bit hard to talk about that's not necessarily easy in words, they have to have a very good understanding of their audience in order to become an interpreter of these ideas that might not exactly be super explicit or might not exactly have a form of words. Thank you. Um, I find that um, music is my favorite form of communication and I think that one of the things that I wanted to look at while doing this project is like how do you take something that is not in words and itself a form of communication and how do you translate that into communication or like written form of communication. Any other questions? 
awesome. All right, thank you guys. <laughs> Okay, I did my research project on how rhetoric creates exclusivity and environmentalism. My initial research was about the effectiveness of certain rhetoric, why some people don't support environmentalism, and if rhetoric can be used to gain support. As my research progressed, my question turned into, is there a connection between the rhetoric and environmentalism and the people who support it? I found out that the exclusive rhetoric used in environmentalism excludes minorities and the working class and poor. <clears throat> environmentalism has changed a lot over the years. In the 30s and 40s, it was about conservation and recycling. In 1962, Silent Spring was published. In 1970 was the first Earth Day and the EPA was formed. In 1972 was the Clean Air Act. In 1989 was the Global Warming Scare. And in 1993, the environmental movement died down. Environmentalism in the 70s was about defending wild places, having clean air and water, controlling the pollution, and controlling the population. Environmentalism today is about domesticating wild places, sustainability, and maintaining the high standard of living while causing less environmental degradation. Environmentalism in the media. Uh, stories usually happen when environmental crises are already obvious, and the effect of that is that the stories will often die once the effects of a crisis are no longer apparent. Human interest determines news. Uh, this leads to a variable mythologizing of science, or turning science into a relatable story instead of presenting facts. Um, the media usually focuses on the present, and this leads to an inaccurate and untimely representation of environmentalism. Uh, the rhetoric used in environmentalism is very exclusive. Many people view it as a rich white social issue. Um, any effort to make subject matter relevant to an audience involves a parallel attempt to create a foundation of shared values. So I decided to research the values of both environmentalism and Americans. Uh, the core values of environmentalism are ecology, sustainability, and health. And the core values of Americans are independence, economy, and equity. The core values of environmentalism can conflict with each other and often conflict with the values of most Americans. In the 60s and 70s, there was a racist element to environmentalism. Uh, it gained popularity at the same time the civil rights movement began. Minorities were used as a scapegoat for pollution and overpopulation problems. And minorities were depicted as having no interest in the environment. There's a divide between the races in environmentalism. Um, this is caused by different lived experiences. Most minorities grow up in poor areas than whites, and this leads to two different ideas of nature, which leads to two different visions for environmentalism. And social justice is usually ignored in decision making, which leads to minority groups overlooked in environmentalism. The poor and working class and environmentalism support fell in the 60s when environmentalists did not take a strong stance on automation and outsourcing, both issues that affect the average American citizen. The exclusion is caused by job security and destructive businesses such as oil, logging, and construction, uh, employers blackmailing their employees to oppose environmental legislation, and sustainability can be really expensive. Some possible solutions are using an all-inclusive rhetoric to unite the population, addressing the environmental issues affecting the poor and minority groups, jobs in a green economy that use union labor and proper media coverage and environmental education. A quote from Edward P.J. Corbett is, one fact that emerges from a study of the history of rhetoric is that there is usually a resurgence of rhetoric during periods of violent social upheaval. And environmentalism is the social issue that needs to be in the limelight. It will affect everyone and everything on this planet. If we don't unite to combat environmental degradation, we will lose our world. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Are there any questions? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> the what? I'm interested in what led you to this topic. What was your kind of inspiration or motivation for it? Um, well, I initially was just researching the rhetoric in environmentalism, but as my research progressed, I kind of found out that some groups are excluded. So I decided to research further into that. Um, I haven't seen any, but I haven't really been looking for any either, so that's <laughs> probably part of it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, hi. Um, my name is Madison Porter, um, and yes, that's that's all I got for you. Um, <laughs> let me guys ask you guys a question real quick. Uh, how many of you guys were asked like where you wanted to go to college, what you wanted to study as a freshman in high school. Raise your hand. Jeez. All right, keep your hand up for a second. How, now how many people were asked um, when they were a senior in high school or after they graduated? Okay, now imagine you're not going to school right after high school. You guys put your hand down. That was me. I didn't go to college right after high school. I'm a freshman, but I'm 20 years old. Um, and when I turned 18, I decided to not go to school. I decided to move to California and pack up all my stuff and move my life across the country uh, to join AmeriCorps National Civilian Community Corps and spend my life doing community service, volunteer work, and disaster relief. Um, and it changed my life forever. And I met these amazing people. This is my team. Uh, we're called Blue Seven. There's four different t colors that signify four different sections of the uh, campus. But these 13 people changed my life forever. And they became my family. We ate together, slept together, <coughs> lived together, breathed together. <laughs> I never, and I've never known people as well as I know these people. And I still talk to them every day. But. Ameri I'm not here to promote AmeriCorps. I'm here to talk about a bigger phenomenon that AmeriCorps is under, which is gap years. And not a lot of people know what gap years are, so I'll give you a quick definition of what a gap year is. Um, this is the Merriman-Webster uh, dictionary definition, uh, one year hiatus from an academic studies to allow for non-academic activities, a period uh, typically an academic year taken by a student as a break between secondary school and higher education. Most people take this period between high school and college, but that doesn't mean that you have to take it between high school and college. A lot of people on my team were either post-college or during college. They decided to take a break and get off the conveyor belt that is the American education system and figure out what they wanted to do with their lives and find out what their passion is. And that's probably why 83% of gappers, which is apparently what we're called, um, are satisfied with our jobs, um, with our careers. And while 50% of the American workforce is not satisfied with their careers and just do it for the money. We do it because we love it. We don't do it for the money. We do it because we're passionate about it. Um, so we find our passion during this year, usually. Um, but we still need college, um, and if I didn't need college to get into the Peace Corps, I wouldn't be here, um, but I do. And uh, that is a big concern for a lot of skeptics and a lot of parents, um, is what if my kid doesn't go back to school because you see how great it is not to be in school and not study and not have to worry about anything. But 90% of gappers do return to school because it is important to us, and it does show that education is important to us. And it does show that we do want to be there to study. 
and that's probably why uh, we get higher GPAs. Um, this is from the AGA, the American Gap Association. Yes, we have an association. No one knows about it. I don't know why you would, but um, we get higher um, GPAs because we found out what we're passionate about and we focus our attention on that and we bring all of our attention on what we want to learn about. Um, and also we have taken a break from school, so we are not as burnt out as a lot of people are. We have given our brains a break and have just relaxed for a year and figured out what we wanted to do with our lives. So it, it shows very much in your academic, um, in your academic work. And that's one of the main concerns that parents do have. Um, but I got a lot of negative comments when I told people, mainly adults, that I was not going to school. Um, these are just a few of some of the uh, reactions and questions that I got um, when I told my parents' friends or my family friends that I'm not going to school. Um, they thought that I was just gonna sit at home for a year and watch TV, um, or I was not gonna get a job. How are you supposed to explain that to your uh, boss when you're older, like you're just taking a year off? When really, if you use your gap year effectively, it's a huge resume enhancer. You learn so many new skills, and you can put them all on your resume. Like I learned how to do construction work. I learned how to garden. I learned how to, I learned people skills when I did disaster relief. I learned I am certified by the Red Cross for disaster skills. Uh, I'm CPR certified, first aid certified. I have learned technology skills. I can put that all on my resume. So it gets me a higher chance of getting hired, which is sort of nice to think about. Um, but even though there are a lot of benefits, um, people don't really see another option besides college because we're pushed from such a young age, from about eighth grade or younger, to go to college. And that's, we think that's the only option we have when it's really not. Um, we're constantly asked what we want to study, where we want to go, when we don't even know where we want to go for lunch that day. So I'm not exactly sure how we're supposed to figure out what we want to do for the rest of our lives. So the question is this, does it benefit us to step back for a little bit or does it benefit us to push forward? Thanks. Questions, comments, anything? Yes. So I'm also a GAP student. Hey. Awesome. Um, I was just wondering why you wanted to go and do research about this subject. It's always been really important to me, and because of the backlash that I got um, from a lot of people, um, and the fact that I've gotten a lot of questions, I'm like, what is a gap year? I'm like, um, I don't really know how to explain this. Um, and there are a lot of people that are like, no, like gap years, you're just gonna fall behind um, once you go on a gap year. I'm like, there might be an answer to this. Um, is it really true that gap years do hold you back or do they push you forward? And I wanted to know that answer. Anything else? Yeah. You talked a lot about negatives. Did you have any people in your life that supported your decision? My parents. They, they pushed me and encouraged me to go on a gap year. They're like, we want you to find your passion. We want you to do what makes you happy. So if that's what you want to do, then do it. But there were a lot of other people that were like, oh, you're just a dumb teenager. You're making a dumb decision. I'm like, but it's my life, so it's not your concern. Anything else? So I'm Ben Sparrow, and my presentation is called Environmental Scientists versus Journalists Writing for Peers in the Public. So in my section of Lang 120, we were tasked with um, comparing two different genres concerning a topic of uh, concern in our field of study, mine being environmental science. And so I compared two, rec two different um, articles. The first was published in El Sevier, which is one of the world's leading um, scientific information providers, and it was 
It was an article co-authored by three environmental scientists discussing permafrost melting in Alaska. And then the New York Times article written by a single journalist which covers the same information, although it's directed to the public, and it cites the El Sevilla article as data. Okay, and in my analysis, I wanted to grapple with the question of what are the most effective factors in both the genre's ability to persuade and inform, which I saw as a scientific author's main purpose in writing. And so before I get into my findings, I want to address a different perspective. In 2011, Teresa Tani published a paper where she conducted a similar ex like research, a study, excuse me, and she found six universal moves or rules essentially that are applicable across writing. And in my study, I found that they were present, although they weren't prevalent, and I found uh, different things that were much more um, effective in persuading and informing an audience. And my first one is the audience. You sh who you are informing and persuading will heavily um, change how you do it. So in the um, research article, it is written by and for environmental scientists. And as a result of that, you need an understanding of climate change and environmental science and research methodology in order to fully comprehend the piece. While in the newspaper article, it's written for a general public, so none of that knowledge is necessary. And it's um, hopefully assured comprehension for everyone. And next is style. In the research article, it is written in the APA format, which is prefaced by an abstract and follows um, the form of intro to methods to um, conclude, no, intro research methods, uh, discussion conclusion. And from that, uh, that does not allow the input of opinion, which is crucial to preserving the legitimacy of scientific work. And uh, that it contrasts to the newspaper article, which subtly mimics this um, form, although is supplemented by what I call fluff, which is things such as defining terminology, explaining concepts, connecting dots a lot of ways, so like general public doesn't have that knowledge, and is also full of pictures, which helps people's comprehension because they don't understand this stuff. And next is purpose. While the two article, the two genres do share the purpose of explaining, um, like informing more people of a specific problem with climate change, the way they do it is differently. <laughs> So in the case of the newspaper article, it is essentially just trying to inform you enough to where you are persuaded to care about the problem of climate change being real and that it's actually harming the earth. While that is assured, assumed knowledge for any scientist that will be reading the research paper, so it doesn't really get into that, it's mostly just about connecting the dots and proving that your data that you are representing is factual and thus uh, relevant in the scientific community. And next is evidence. The evidence used to support the different findings are very different. And in the case of the newspaper, the evidence is the, the research article. You're going to trust a scientist, someone who's more informed than you, and they're giving you data. You're just going to believe it nine times out of 10, especially if it's published by the New York Times. Um, so from that, uh, the, data, the way that the research article, though, um, proves itself is in methodology. A scientist is not going to just trust any data you give them. They want to know how you compiled that data and using what methods. And from that, they can conclude that it is relevant in the scientific community. And what this means for us is that all those aforementioned um, facts or parts of um, factors, excuse me, are all part of rhetoric. And the definition of rhetoric I use is the conscious use of language done by Victor Villanueva. He said that. And from that, if you understand someone else's conscious choices to persuade and inform an audience, you can replicate that yourself. So we should be taught to ask the questions. Who are you talking to? Why are you talking to them? What are you telling them? And how do you support it? And so what? Everything, all those, are what we should base a class like Lang 120 around, which is giving us the skills that can be transferable to all of our different disciplines. Because not all of you are environmental science majors. So with that, uh, thanks. <laughs> Questions? What's up? Why did you choose environmental science? I actually took a gap year and I discovered my passion for environmental science along the way when I was volunteering. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out.
right, so uh, what we made in uh, Ms. Eggman's class was a, an infomercial, which is a conglomeration of all the, the research skills we uh, learned and implemented throughout the semester. Have you or someone you know struggled on a research paper? Have you broken down, gone completely crazy, or been charged with property damage? Then the Do-It-Yourself Research Guide informational pamphlet is the perfect thing for you. You look like you need help. Take this. Let's see what some of these students are so confused about. What's the matter with kids today? longer can this injustice continue? What's the point? If someone owns a piece of land, do they own it all the way to the center of the earth? Now let's explain what's in our pamphlet. Our poster is about inquiry and reflection, and we're using the example of Sherlock to help explain inquiry. We chose to explain by using magnifying glasses with implied meaning, context, and reflection. Reflection is to form your own opinion. So by looking at the context clues and evidence and implied meaning, you can form your opinions about what you're researching. This part of the pamphlet focuses on information literacy. Um, that has to do with finding credible sources, uh, finding evidence ethically, analyzing evidence, and citing evidence. And in the pamphlet, you'll find this tree with different branches that talks about ways to find information literacy correctly. Let's see how much our pamphlets have helped our students. Research writing for dummies? This has been the best thing I could have asked for. I mean, Oh my gosh, it just has everything that I need, honestly. I mean, I cannot praise this more. Everything I have is thanks to this good pamphlet. Truly, it saved me. Like, my research writing has improved ginormously because of this little gem. Okay. <laughs> we did end up cutting some corners, but um, okay, any questions? I'd love to know, I was having a hard time hearing. I'd love to know what's in that, the research guide, the pamphlet. Oh. I had such a hard time, I think it was just the volume. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you just tell us a little bit? Um, it was basically, critical inquiry, um, information literacy, and um, rhetorical communication, like how to build a research project. 
Yeah. Did you all have any of those pamphlets? People might want them. <laughs> 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 we love raising the well, At the moment, we only have one copy of it. <laughs> Okay. My name is Audrey Buckler, and my presentation is titled Ineffective Ways We Talk About Gun Control. For my research project, um, we were told we could research the rhetoric of an issue. And coming from where I come from, I have had a lot of experience with kind of different views on this topic. So it's kind of clear that today you'll find a lot of displays of violence in media and all over the place. In 2017 alone, there have been over 300 mass shootings in the US, two of which occurred just in the time that I've been researching this, being the Las Vegas shooting in that uh, Southern Springs, Texas, one of which the Las Vegas shooting was deemed the most deadly in modern history. Um, just as often as we see displays of this large scale violence were expo exposed to the rhetoric and the harsh ways they're addressed. The prevailingly vocalized arguments are either completely for or completely against gun control, and such debate is due to different interpretations of the Second Amendment, primarily. Some believe it's an unalienable right, while others believe it is outdated and should be re-examined. There are, in a poll conducted by NPR shortly after the tragedy in Las Vegas, Findings showed that 58% of Americans overall strongly favored the banning of assault-style weapons, which are fully or semi-automatic firearms. It's interesting to compare these results to the national discussion on gun laws because the idea of a moderate majority doesn't align with the prevailingly vocalized arguments. This misrepresentation of public opinion can be attributed to how the issue of gun control is presented on a largely access platform. So tonight I want to go over the three ways that gun control is talked about that are in ineffective. And the first approach is the pro-con approach. And a lot of people are familiar with this concept of coming up with a pro-con list to make a decision or a choice. And it might be effective to that end, but when it comes to rhetoric, it can be harmful when discussing controversial topics. The biggest, prob the biggest problem that this presents is a false dichotomy. Uh, false dichotomy is a logical fallacy that presents only two options and ignores all other views and options. And in the case of gun control, it's presenting either only people who are completely for gun control laws or completely against them. And it completely ignores the moderate, the moderate point of view, which if you recall, the NPR poll presents that that's the majority. So pro-con rhetoric is misleading and misinform misinformative. The second argument is not a time for politics. After the Las Vegas attack, Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee declared that the aftermath of shootings was an inappropriate time to discuss politics and gun control, and that you should focus primarily on victims. And though none would argue that this is a noble and sentimental approach, it is a lot more manipulative than it seems. This kind of argument applies to pathos and emotion and appeals to the viewer or listener's sympathy for the families and victims of gun violence. Um, but it vilifies those who use shootings as a platform for change, political or otherwise. It also begs the question, when is it a good time? It's not getting done after the shootings or any other time, clearly, because we're not having any other laws to enforce these policies. So this kind of argument with pathos portrays activists in a negative light and assures that no further action can be taken. The third example I have is hard facts or hardly facts. In Thomas Sowell's article for Investors Business Daily, he asserts that like many hot button issues, gun control debates are based solely in terms of fixed preconceptions with little or no examination of hard facts. Most people would agree with this because there are examples of it everywhere, but it's kind of ironic because this exact article has no hard facts of its own. <laughs> I originally intended to use this article as a legitimate source, but the more I read it, the more I realized it served as an example of the logical fallacy slippery slope. In a slippery slope, people make assertions with no evidence and then make assumptions with no evidence. This is clearly manipulative and ineffective because it aims to deceive the public. All these forms of rhetoric have one thing in common. They only address the polarities of the debate. This is deceptive in displaying the misinformation of blatant vilification of pro and anti-gun control advocates by and against each other. These belligerent arguments coexist with the lack of action taken to protect for prevent further gun violence. So one has to ask, 
is this large scale antagonization the reason nothing is being done in regards to gun laws? For all the time we spend preventing a decision, any number of violent acts can occur. The shooting in Las Vegas was the 273rd to take place in 2017, occurring on the 274th day of the year, meaning that on average, there has been one deadly shooting for every day of the year. As a nation, we face a critical question. What can we do to prevent further gun violence? There is no clear answer and no way to please everyone. The only thing that is evident that something has to be done, and I believe that the first step to a solution is to change the way we approach the issue, meaning learning how to discuss gun control without vilifying each other because clearly the belligerent rhetoric that is currently utilized is ineffective. And to change the way we approach the topic of gun control, we must alter, must alter the harmful rhetoric with which we address it. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. I want to hear more about what the effective discourse would be, what that would look like. Um, in my opinion, it would just be non belligerent dis conversation, like respecting others' opinions and being able to talk about it in a non attacking, like, atmosphere or way. You showed some information for something called assault style weapons. Could you define what that is? The plain and, like, Merriam Webster definition is semi or fully automatic assault rifles and, like, things that just fire automatically, like machine guns assault rifles, and fully automatic rifles, I believe, are already outlawed, but that is not really enforced. I have to uh, make a clarification on that. An assault weapon, as defined by the assault weapons ban, is a semi-automatic weapon that has certain attachments that is, are deemed that are only used for a military sale purpose. Mm -hmm. You don't need to on here. Pistol grips, your folding stocks, barrel shrouds. Automatic weapons are regulated under the National Firearms Act and under the uh, 1980, 1980, uh, 1986 Act, they've been, the machine gun ban was registered, machine gun registry was closed, so no new machine guns are able to be registered. Okay. I did find that um, the same with the attachments. I did find that too. Um, and yeah, that is true that they are outlawed and they're supposed to be regulated, but a lot of times, clearly, like in cases like Las Vegas, it's not enforced or regulated in the way that it should be. That's, um, Different matter that was based on what was going on with the ATF. The what was used in Las Vegas was something called a bump stop, which facilitates bump firing. And it was approved by the ATF since it doesn't technically make the gun into a machine gun. So there's an issue of technicality of that. Okay, well, thank you. I didn't know that. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. So, was it the Las Vegas shooting that like, caused you to research? Um, I had already started researching this when that occurred. It was literally like the first thing that happened like after researching this. So I thought it was, you know, kind of a pressing matter, especially after that. Any more questions? Thank you. All right. Um, so I researched um, the differences and the similarities between art and academia, um, specifically how medium affects message. Um, and I did that by looking at a poem by one of my favorite poets um, and a scholarly article about um, school feeding programs and child development. Um, so two subjects that I'm interested in. Um, so I found a lot of similarities and a lot of differences. Um, the main obvious difference was the length. The poem was only two pages, um, and then the scholarly article was much longer. Um, the article was written with standard paragraphs, whereas the poem had short lines with line breaks, um, and the sentences went over lines. Um, the article relied heavily on data through graphs, statistics, charts, all that, um, and the poem didn't use any numbers at all. Um, and then the tones of the pieces were very different. Um, Neruda's piece was much more reverent, surreal, um, abstract, and then the article was scholarly, scholarly and concrete. Um, but thematically, they were 
exactly the same. They're both talking about um, the power that quality food has um, and how that can bring a lot of positive things to impoverished communities. Um, they both introduced um, their topics. Um, they both referenced other works and punctuation and capitalization was standard throughout both of them. Um, so I found a lot of pros and cons about scholarly articles. Um, pros are people like data and numbers, that's easy to digest. Um, standard sentence structures and formats make sense to people. Um, it had a firm stance and conclusion, so it wasn't vague. Um, it was persuasive, so people got the point. Um, and therefore, it accesses an academic audience and a public audience, although the general public could be maybe not so understanding of more like technical scholarly um, or like even like horticultural terms. Um, and despite all of those positives, there was little emotional connection or personal resonation, which I like poetry, so I didn't like that. But some people, it depends on the audience. So that was something I thought was interesting. Um, yeah, I just didn't have fun reading it, but um, it made total sense. So um, yeah, so the poem was the opposite. I loved reading it, um, but it was super open-ended and ambiguous, which there's pros and cons in that own theme. Um, it relied heavily on imagery and kind of like creating pictures, whereas the poem, I mean the article had to um, provide actual pictures to put things in context. Um, it focused on universal human themes, which the article didn't really do. Um, so in looking at both of them together, it provided a fuller picture on the themes. Um, so cons of that kind of ambiguous universal human themes is that it's not as accessible to academia. Like a mathematician could connect like emotionally to it, but it wouldn't connect to the field necessarily. Um, and there's no factual evidence and it's not persuasive, except for the fact that it's emotional, it tugs at the heartstrings, all that. Um, so my so what is together, it's two valuable contributions to the same conversation. So they work together um, despite their affordances and constraints. Um, they target different audiences, but they have the same purpose and goal. Um, so I just thought it was interesting to look at the similarities and differences between art and academia. How do they intertwine? Where's the line between them? And is there such a thing as academic art? Is there such a thing as artistic academia? Um, and that's something that applies to my personal goals as a writer. Um, and my concluding questions are just kind of how do art and academia connect to express universal human themes? Um, and how do we break down barriers between the two genres? The end. Envision a way you had a, one of the questions at the end was about this art academia, how you as a poet could influence or change the way an academic article might be presented by including some of these pros that you had on your pro list for poetry. Yeah, I think those are like really good ideas. I don't think I have an answer to that though, <laughs> um, but I know what you're talking about. I'm interested in why you chose these two seemingly very, I mean, they are very different genres. Like, what led you to think about that comparison? Because I don't think that's something that most people would think to compare. <coughs> yeah, so I started out with the article because child development and urban agriculture are things that I'm really interested in. Um, and then I was like, how could these things be talked about differently? How can they connect to more like actual emotional human stuff? Um, so I love Neruda, so I looked through his works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you take into account that you were reading Neruda in translation, or did you read it? I did. Um, yeah, I looked at two different translations um, and compared a couple different translations of it, so yeah.
Okay, so I'm from also Abigail Hickman's class and we did a collaborative class research or like reflective portion of our research project and we made a video. So that's supposed to be like a research survival guide. So that's what our project was. Do you want to say anything? Um, yeah, we outlined the three um, learning outcomes for the semester uh, and created, yeah, a guide for a research project. Our whole class worked on it. We worked very, very hard. Thank you. Okay, scholars, research papers are due on Tuesday. Get out of here and have a good weekend. See Grant, while everyone is working, you are procrastinating. Research Survival Guide. Rule number one, don't procrastinate. Think ahead, make a plan, and have a goal. Rule number two, create stimulating research questions. Don't ask shallow questions. friends up to? I wonder what we're doing. Oh, I've been starving. I'm glad I'm eating these chips. Mm. Oh, Donovan texted me. Yeah, I should work on that research project. We have not started it yet. Yeah, okay, Donovan, yeah. Oh, Kendra! Yeah, let's go to the club! Heck yeah! Was that the best idea? Yeah. College is supposed to be fun and full of parties. I don't think so, Grant. I'm the ghost of Research Project President. Brought to you by Abigail Hickman. Let me show you what you should be doing. Research Survival Guide. Rule number three. Collaborate. Bounce ideas off of other people. Rule number four. Be aware of your audience. Know who you're talking to. of Research Project Future. You can't copy and paste for a research project. I'll show you what to do. Brought to you by Abigail Hickman. Research Survival Guide. Rule number five, use reliable sources. Rule number six, produce unique work or go to prison. I mean, <laughs> <It's> so <laughs> Hey, do we get our research papers back today? Oh, yeah, we do! Yeah. Okay, scholars, big moment! We're returning the research papers. I know a lot of you are a little bit nervous. Some of you should be. Okay, here we go.
Abigail Hickman. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Was it supposed to be like Nancy classified or did it just like happen to be like Yep. <laughs> Directly, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yes. So I want to know what you guys think you are, all of you who are involved in the project. What do you think you learned most about doing research that is really useful when you go going forward? This is a lot of fun to watch. What else? Did, what do you think you've got? Um, well, I'll just maybe speak for the class. Um, I think like as far as the research or like the um, learning outcomes went, like communicating in a rhetorically effective way was like the one we like honed in on for this movie because um, we wanted to make it funny and we wanted to like riff off Ned's Declassified to like you know keep your attention and like help it stick in your brain, I guess, or like yeah, how to like make a research project. Yes. So how did you go about like doing that process of being like, okay, like, I want to make this like next to classified. So did you go through a whole process of like watching and being like, okay, here's the elements of like what goes into this and this is how we're gonna do it. Or did you like just read it? Um I think we were all pretty familiar with it like beforehand. And I forget who made the original like suggestion. Oh it was Kendra. Um <laughs> And yeah, so maybe you can talk on this, Kendra. Um. I just thought it would be like a good way to keep everybody interested because most of everybody like in this generational era knows about the Nets to classify. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, that's a good idea. We should do that. Yes. <laughs> um. Do you all have anything you want to say? I think I can. Thank you very much. <laughs>At the beginning of the year, we listened to a series of different podcasts, including Strong Opinions Loosely Held by Eliza Kresinger, Revisionist History by Malcolm Gladwell, and Lore by Aaron Monk. Afterwards, we wrote essays on topics similar to those that we had heard. Then we each produced a podcast based on our essay. Some of us discussed local legends. Unfamiliar Familiarity by Nikolai Wise, a podcast about Zelda Fitzgerald and how she has influenced culture in Asheville. WTF UNCA by Ash Hopkins, which explored the campus rec department at UNCA. Should College Athletes Get Paid by Trey Jernigan, a podcast that interviews a college baseball coach to get his opinion on whether or not college athletes should get paid and the pros and cons of this. The Winning Way by Ethan Tressler, a podcast that discusses college athletics and the importance of winning programs with an interview of a head baseball coach. Some of us discuss topics of interest to us. Misconceptions by Cooper Knight, a podcast which talks about how tattoos should not determine one's employability and work ethic. Haters or Skaters by Jillian Butler, a podcast about the sexist misconceptions of females in a male-dominated skating world. Voices from the Past by Carly Dubrow, a podcast which highlighted the influx of refugees from World War II to the experimental, art-centered, and legendary local academy, Black Mountain College. It's Time to Get Real About Homelessness in Asheville by Tess McCaleb, a podcast that examines the rising rate of homelessness in Buncombe County and suggests the solutions to the issue. Keeping Up with America by Sydney Wilson, a podcast that addresses the importance of bilingualism in a diversifying country. We each recorded an interview with an expert on our topic. Then we edited the interview. Most of us added music. Some of us even recorded the music on our own. The result was a podcast that mirrored what we had learned. Each was aimed at the audience of our classmates. What we learned was... You can't really know much about a topic through a quick search, but it's worth it to follow through. It's easy to get material from an interview if you ask the person being interviewed about their personal passions and ambitions. We are a generation that is changing the job industry, and every person's effort makes a difference. It is important to get outside of your comfort zone because it can lead to interesting experiences and findings. Researching a topic that you are interested in allows you to obtain a deeper appreciation and knowledge of the topic. Any questions? Yeah, any questions? I have a question. 
Did did you after your pod, did you guys have to present a transcript of the podcast or was it it was just in the I'm just wondering we I made my students do transcripts and I think it was too much. Did, it was so much work to do the podcast, right? What did you find about the process? I mean, personally I found we didn't have to do a transcript. We wrote an essay beforehand okay. on the topic and then we made the podcast about it. So in that way it was much easier to find our data yeah. to talk about and made the whole process just easier in general. What did you like about the podcast forum for research? I mean, for me, it was, as a person who has listened to podcasts before, mm -hmm. it was a way to automatically get me to dive into the topic and become interested. I would say it's also a good way to actually like get people to listen. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, it was a lot of work <clears throat> just to make the podcast in itself. Um, but in addition to the paper, it really like brought everything together. Um, although we talked about different, or some people did, talked about different issues in their paper opposed to their podcast, it all was tied together under the same overarching theme, which was really interesting. Thank you. Can I ask what topics the three of you each did individually? Um, so, uh, you can probably tell what I did, uh, tattoos in the workforce. I did one that wasn't listed on there. I did um, <clears throat> uh, Dungeons and Dice. I focused on how Dungeons and Dragons can be used in an education setting to help teach people and get them to open up. I talked about the refugee influx to Black Mountain College. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Um, okay, hi, I'm Asia, and um, uh, I'm in Professor McNair's Lang 120 class, and for our second paper, we had to write a research-based op-ed, and I decided to write mine on Christopher Columbus, and I discussed why we no longer need a Columbus Day, and why it's wrong to continue celebrating Columbus knowing what we know about him now. And this topic's important because many people don't know much about Columbus's actions once he got to this hemisphere, they just know that he was here. And so for my project, um, after we wrote the paper, we had to, she wanted us to get creative and um, just show for a pre, do a presentation and show what we learned. So I made um, three posters in the media design lab that I feel like captured what I learned and what I'd like others to take away from my paper. So um, this is my first poster and it shows a picture of Columbus and it asks the question, am I willing to excuse genocide? And I really wanted to emphasize this question because one of the main goals when writing my paper was to get people to ask themselves questions, um, questions about Columbus Day, Columbus himself, why do we celebrate him despite knowing all the violence and terror he forced upon people? And then the hashtags, if you can see them, um, they say stop violence and end Columbus Day, which were two of the other main takeaways from my paper. And then um, my next poster. Thank you. Um, the second poster I made, it includes a photo of the Taino people, which were the native people that inhabited the islands that Columbus came to. And um, he wrote, Columbus actually wrote to the Spanish monarchy about the people he encountered there and so um, I added two quotes from a letter that he wrote to King Ferdinand, and it says, Your Highness may believe that in all the world there can be no better people. They traded with us and gave us everything. With goodwill, they took great pleasure in pleasing us. Um, I really liked these quotes um, in contrast with the picture I used. The picture is actually, it's a, um, it was a popular torture method that Columbus and other Spaniards used against the Taino people. It was, um, it's, they would take 13 Taino men and burn them alive to represent Jesus and the 12 apostles. And then, and then my final poster. Um, my final poster, you can see King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain. They were the um, monarchs, the Spanish monarchs that funded Columbus's journey to the Caribbean and Underneath them, there are some pictures of the Taino people. I put black bars over the eyes of the king and queen because um, just to represent how blind they were to the evils Columbus committed. And um, the Spanish monarchy also played, they also benefited from Columbus's crimes. All of the Taino men over 14 
were required to give the Spanish um, gold and they were basically taxed by the Spanish, taxed by people that they never met and taxed by a country they'd never been to or heard of. Um, underneath, I also wrote underneath it, um, open your eyes, imperialism is not progress. And I think my paper and the photos above depict, depict why that statement is true. European exploration and expansion to other continents has only been beneficial to Europeans. And in Columbus's case, um, he received notoriety and fame for his discovery and Spain's economy expanded and they began sending more people to the Americas. All the Tainos received was a genocide and um, women became sex slaves and men and boys were sent over to be slaves in Spain and they didn't really gain anything from it. It was just Columbus and Europeans that gained. And um, in doing this, I didn't want to just make, try and convince everyone to hate Columbus and prove why he's like such a terrible person. I just wanted people mostly to just ask questions and begin to open their minds, I guess, and think about like who we uplift here. So that's it. Any questions? Yes. Um, I was just wondering if you had an opinion on Thanksgiving. I know a lot of people have wanted to make, like, we rename it to become a remembrance of Native Americans. I didn't know if you had an opinion on that because you were talking about Columbus Day. Um, I agree with that. I think that would be a good thing. I, I guess like if you know the real story of Thanksgiving, we shouldn't really, it shouldn't really be something to be celebrated. We should definitely use Thanksgiving and Columbus Day as a day of remembrance for the lives that were lost. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Tiffany Bailey, and I'm in Professor Pisano's class, and I did my presentation on live music, and I have a video, so I'm gonna show it for you guys. Music has been a part of the human experience for ages. From ancient Rome, to the Middle Ages, to jazz in New Orleans, to Woodstock in 1969, and even to Tennessee's very own Bonnaroo. Today we'll look at how live music affects society. We'll look at how it affects people, how it affects artists, and how it affects the music industry. When listening to music, there are times when people experience chills. This is a result of a psychophysiological arousal. This arousal then becomes a rewarding effect for the body. Chills have also been proven to cause physical changes to the body, such as an altered heart rate, respiration, and electrical activity in muscles. The stimuli, in this case arousal, sends signals to the ventral tegmental area, also known as the VTA, to increase activity. Dopamine is then released to different brain regions, such as the amygdala and nucleus accumbens. This is one of the main reasons why people are happy while they listen to music. When it comes to live music and the effect it has on artists, I thought it would be rational to personally ask an artist. On November 9th, I DM'd a man named Adam Entrader on Twitter. Adam is the lead singer and founder of the band Triathlon. I asked Adam if he had time that if he could give me a sentence or two on how live music has affected him personally. I wasn't sure if he was going to respond or not, but when he did, he surprisingly gave me more than two sentences. He basically said performing has given him the ability to easily change his mood, to be more self-aware, to be more humble, and to be thankful for the opportunities they have got. Side note, if you're looking for new music, I recommend them, and every single one of their songs. Just saying. If you ever want to see a show, you can go to the websites of these places and look for upcoming shows. These are just a few that I'm aware of, but there are plenty of more out there in the city of Asheville. Live music not only benefits the artists, but venues, record labels, and other businesses. Both venues and record labels get a profit from what the artists make. Businesses, both local and big, are also supported. I really like live music because it's a really great opportunity for me to see my favorite bands and meet awesome people and potentially meet even the band members and it's really awesome to have great energy around and um, listen to my favorite songs live because they listen to that. Yeah.
what's your favorite, like who's been your favorite performer? Um, I saw Glass Animals three times and still ready for the next one because it was really great and I was front row each time. Oh. I love concerts because I can dance and sing as loud as I want and everyone's there to just have fun and appreciate the music so it's a really good vibe. And I'd say one of my favorite concerts was Travis Scott because I was in the pit and it was just super crazy and fun. One thing I do to support artists is buying posters. I always buy them at concerts so the money goes towards them rather than buying from like a website or something else. And I like buying posters because they look nice and I get to support the artists so it's a win-win. Any questions? Yes. Um, what's been your favorite show? Uh, that's a hard question. Um, I would have to say, hmm, that's really hard. I'd probably have to say 21 Pilots. I saw them at Music Midtown last year, and it was pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, have you seen Muse? Because I know you're going to be at Carolina Rebellion next year. I have not. I was supposed to see them this summer, but then something happened in Charlotte, and so I was pretty upset. But okay. where'd you say? Um, they're going to be at uh, Carolina Rebellion for 2018, so... I'll look into that, because I really want to see them. Yeah. Why did you choose this topic? Um, I'm really passionate about music. It's kind of all I think about and do. So I thought it would be fun to do my project on it. Yeah. It's not really a question, but I really like your taste in music. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what do you plan to major in? Um, I plan on majoring in psychology, so... Music's just kind of a hobby of mine. Any others? Okay. Thank you. Hi, um, my name's Yasin Rodriguez, and I, my Lang 120 uh, professor is um, Deborah James, and um, my project is on underrepresentation of minorities in academically gifted programs. And the reason I chose this topic was because it's a very topic that's like close to me. So yeah, here's my video. Um, obviously, historically, there has been inequity in the, in the ways in which those programs have identified students. I was a part of the International Baccarat program. I was. I took all honors classes and I took like an AP class as well. Yes, I was involved in academically gifted programs. I did feel like I was a little excluded just because in every uh, honors class I had, I was usually the only Hispanic person, the only person of color. Obviously, there were times when there is a clear separation due to like skin colors or like socioeconomic backgrounds. Race correlates pretty strongly with, with socioeconomic status in our country. Uh, students who are tested into like academic, um, academically and intellectually gifted programs, often they do that by taking tests that have uh, some pretty profound cultural biases in them that have been shown to have cultural biases in them. The people who make these tests uh, think, oh, well, certainly every child knows this, when it's really an, it's a, it's a normative assumption that the, the test takers are assuming that every child might know a, a certain touchstone of white culture. Being more culturally aware or just seeing things from the students' perspectives. To involve a little bit more culture into the classroom. And I think this, this, the teachers uh, 
aren't even necessarily doing that with bad intentions. I think they all do have the concern of the student, but those assumptions, those cultural, often racially and ethically driven assumptions, really prime that pump. I personally did feel pressure due to my skin color. I did. I felt like I had, there was something I needed to uphold. And I couldn't take like classes that were like more fun, quote unquote, such as like wood shop. Like everyone expected something from me. I definitely felt pressure because of the color of my skin, because of the well-known stereotype that Asians are super smart and they're supposed to know everything. So therefore, I felt like I had to be really well of me the top of my class. But sometimes my peers would point out if I, um, you know, didn't get a question right or if I had a low test score, they would just always make comments like, oh, well, guess you're not really that Asian because uh, you didn't score that well or stuff like that, which bothered me at times. The stereotype of, oh, you're Asian, you must be really good at math. And so if you don't get an A in your math class, wow, okay, I guess you're a dumb Asian or whatever, you know, ridiculous things like that. Part of it came from my peers, but also part of it came from myself. The positive stereotypes can be just as damaging and stressful. Yeah, I do feel that there really is a lack. I do feel like there's a lack of color in academically gifted programs. I do feel as if there is a lack of diversity in academically gifted programs. Um, I do feel like there's a lack of diversity in academically gifted programs. The lack of diversity has made me feel like an outsider. And I think because of that, I'm always self-aware of how many minorities are in my classes. Um, though my school was predominantly Black, we didn't have uh, that many Black students in the IB program. Uh, I think the lack of diversity in the IB program in my school stemmed from the fact that not every student had that support that I did. Um, I had family members who encouraged me to challenge myself, uh, to be the best me that I can be. And you know, not every student had that support that I did. Uh, this has affected me outside of school. Again, it's just made me really self-aware that I am Asian. So growing up with him, I always kind of like almost had a confusion of identity because I didn't know who sh I should associate with because, you know, the Hispanic community, I was never in classes with them, but then I have my lifestyle that correlates with them. And then I have, you know, with uh, white people, like I spent an all day in class with them. I shared the same ideas with them, but then I didn't have, you know, the after school um, relationship with them that I would have with my Hispanic friends. And there again, it's just a matter of interrogating those underlying cultural and racial and ethnic assumptions. Um, and that it takes time and it takes will. Race and uh, race and ethnicity to uh, are, are are real constructs. We have we have made them, and we can't just unmake them and ignore them. So this idea of color blindness is 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 ridiculous. Um, but at the same time, we can't insist on we can't insist on conflating someone's race with their performance in a particular in a particular domain and to do that is 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 equally ridiculous Questions? Yeah. I was just a bit like I, I had a hard time grasping what your solution was there at the end. Like I, I was I was hearing what Patrick was saying about um, eliminating some of these biases. I was just curious like what, what your idea for a solution was there. Um, like he said, race and ethnicity are real things that we have socially constructed. And so just kind of removing that stigma of like the person you are and the color you are it doesn't relate to what your academic performance should be and it should be um, the historical evidence of that showing up in these um, 
tests that like bring you into these academically gifted programs, I feel like those should be removed and we should see more past what a person's ability is just because of the color of their skin. I feel like once you get to college, you see more of those peers that have crossed those boundaries and have proven themselves to be more than what their color shows. And I feel like, yes, there is a little bit more diversity once you get to college, but you have to get past the high school part to get there. Any more questions? I wonder if you look into any, I don't know, um, but any of the statistics about, in terms of college or even high school, what the representation, what the what the percentage of students of color in academic, academically gifted or, or honors programs are. Um, I have looked into the statistics, and they are significantly higher once you reach the college, but it's not as, it's not like a balance because it is, you know, it college brings in people from all over the place and high school is just in that significant area. So in, it's a significant higher number, but it's not as it should be. All right. All right, thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Nicholas Schneider. This is Madison Carson. Uh, for a multimedia project in Lang 120, we made a short shadow puppet movie called uh, La Loba, A Story of Revival. Uh, we have a short presentation sort of explaining the meaning and context of this story, which we're pulling up now. Hi, I'm Madison. So, can you hear me? How do I, hello? <laughs> okay. So, an important part of fairy tales that we've discovered through class is archetypes. And archetypes are really important in Jungian psychology because they're symbols that have a reoccurring theme. And they're usually symbolic images that we unconsciously perceive and kind of just that is, sorry. Um, and these symbols are present in our individual consciousness and our collective consciousness. And um, collective consciousness, like an example, would be uh, the culture that we live in. And these symbols can be derived from art, mythology, religion, and stories. So here's just some pictures of pretty well-known protagonists and antagonists that we know from stories, um, which then ties into an archetype that we'd like to talk about from fairy tales, which is the big bad wolf archetype. So this is an evil archetype, and it mostly originates from Central Europe. The characteristics of this archetype is that they're predacious and murderous towards humans. They're the antagonist, and they're always up to something that's not good. Um, sometimes they have supernatural attributes, a couple of fairy tale examples would be like the Little Red Riding Hood, the Three Little Pigs, and Peter and the Wolf are just a few to name. Um, but this big bad wolf archetype has created this association that wolf behavior and a wolf itself are evil. And this has had detrimental effects on wolf conservation, especially one that's here in North Carolina that's local. In North Carolina, this is the only place where the red wolves live in the wild. They are one of the most endangered species in the world and the rarest species of wolves. There are less than 300 of them that are alive. They weigh roughly 45 to 70 pounds. Their diet mostly contain, uh, consists of small mammals, berries, and insects. Uh, currently, our senator, Thomas, Tom Tillis, has asked to end conservation uh, movements and programs for the red wolf because he believes that these wolves are terrorizing humans 
but there has never been any documentation of a red wolf killing a person. So this idea that humans are being terrorized by red wolves is inaccurate and has no basis. Um, and because of this stigma towards them, they are being illegally killed. So here's just some quick facts. Uh, the red wolf domain used to be across the southeast and because of in, well, European settlers and persecution, they only live in this pocket of North Carolina now. Uh, 200 of them live in captivity and less than 100 live in the wild today. So through fairy, sorry, through fairy tales, we've learned that fairy tales have a really profound impact on our behavior and how we perceive things. So we wanted to retell a story that doesn't use this big bad wolf archetype that tells a different story about wolves, uh, which is Loloba, that translates to wolf woman. And yeah, so here it is, and we hope you enjoy it. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. What made you decide to tell your story with the shadow? Um, it's a really good question. We, both of us, um, come from a Waldorf school where using puppetry is just something that's kind of woven into the curriculum. 
And we were also really inspired by Paperhand Puppets, which are some local artists that are environmentalists that throw on a shows in um, Chapel Hill and Greensboro. So I think those were definitely two elements that inspired us. And along with just fairy tales, we were learning that uh, shadow puppetry is one of the oldest forms of retelling a story. So we thought it all kind of blended well together. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you want to answer? Sure. The Red Wolf. Yeah, they're um, they're exclusively over on the east in the um, more marsh areas along the coast. Yeah, they're not in this area. Mm -hmm. They used to be. Yes. Um, do, you, do you believe like the creation of the werewolf was something that also came up from like fairy tales, like like that narrative that was sort of scary beings or? We didn't look into that all that much, but it definitely ties yeah, in with that uh, big bad wolf archetype. Um, the price stem from like the which is actually a, it's an actual type of psychosis where a person basically believes that they're an animal, and then there were cases, especially in New York, where people believe that they're wolves and basically murder people. So that's probably where it came from. Mm -hmm. Right. What, what trigger is? Sure, I would be happy to answer this. This is actually, um, I mean, he's made these statements quite a few times, but uh, there's a recent one from a couple weeks ago in November. Anyway, the uh, main opposition from the senator is has to do with uh, farmers because this there's the uh, so the area that they live in is a protected park, but obviously you can't control an animal's behavior, so they have a tendency of straying off and maybe killing a chicken or two, and this has really upset farmers. Um, there's live recordings you can see of discussions, uh, but basically he's supporting farmers who don't want to maybe adjust their lives to this animal. Um, because they just don't want to put up with it. They don't really want to coexist, so that's where his narrative comes from. Um, but I don't really see how like a red wolf killing a chicken or two is really uh, terrorizing humans. That's just my opinion. Um, so I hope that answered that enough. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I'm Kenneth Bartholo. My professor is Ms. Pisano over there. And I did my presentation on what exactly makes street perform makes Asheville a viable city for street performance. So without further ado, let's get this started. As a city, I love Asheville. Its downtown area captivates me. One of the defining features of downtown Asheville is this large amount of street performers, studying audiences of tourists and locals alike. To better understand the city and downtown, I researched what exactly made Asheville a viable place for street performers. I come to the conclusion that Asheville is able to host its street performance community because of Asheville lawmakers cooperating to allow it, because of Asheville's geography, and because of Asheville's large tourism industry. For Asheville to be a viable place for street performers, first there must be laws allowing people to perform. The city of Asheville gives people the right to perform on public property, though there are some regulations to keep everything safe and enjoyable. Rather obviously, performers can't do anything that would harm people or property, so performances including inherently dangerous acts are out of the question. You can't juggle chainsaws or eat fire. Also, buskers are required to keep six feet of walking pedestrian space free and not let their audiences become so large that they spill out onto the street, so some crowd awareness is necessary. As to not annoy other performers and pedestrians, 40 feet of space is required between each group of buskers, and particularly loud and disturbing noises are not permitted. The city of Asheville has sided with the performers in allowing them to keep on performing, which is a vital reason why Asheville has the downtown scene that it does. However, for the safety and joy of everyone else, regulations are necessary. 
Another reason Asheville is such a prime city for street performance is due to its geography. Asheville is located in the Appalachia Mountain Range, a place with a rich and exciting history. Buskers downtown often play their music on instruments that have a strong connection to Appalachia and folk music in general. In downtown Asheville, we see the use of banjos, washboards, and even spoons. Oftentimes, traditional folk songs are played, which have been passed down through genera generations. These sources of musical inspiration feed directly into Asheville's music scene. <laughs> of downtown also contributes to why Asheville is such a good place for street performance. The sidewalks are broad, giving space for buskers, a possible audience surrounding them, and pedestrians to still walk by. For this reason, performers will often play at places like the Flatiron Statue, the corners of Pritchard Park, outside of Mass General Store, and outside of Tupelo Honey Cafe. Asheville's tourism industry also has a strong influence on making the city viable for street performance. The tourists who come to Asheville are attracted to watching the buskers, and the buskers play their music to amaze tourists and to hopefully generate donations from them. Through this ebb and flow, there is a sense of symbiosis between the performers and the tourists. The buskers of Asheville can inspire others to go out and perform, contributing to keeping Asheville's busking community alive and growing. My personal experience with the city of Asheville and with the street performers of downtown can attest to this. Before I moved to Asheville, I was amazed by the street performers downtown, and when I would visit, I fell in love with the city in part because of them. Now I live in Asheville and have plans to perform downtown with some friends of mine, thanks to being inspired by these buskers. So I think my research has accurately answered my initial question of what makes Asheville a viable city for street performers. The lawmakers who allow street performers to take place, the geography of Asheville, and the tourism industry in Asheville all play into what makes this city possible to host buskers. May the street performers of Asheville continue performing well into the future. Thank you for watching. All right, y'all are there, any questions? Um, my question is, as a city develops and becomes more popularized, you know, gentrification happens. So I was wondering, are uh, musicians performing in downtown uh, being more restricted as it becomes more popular for tourists to come? Like, and the, you know, the sidewalks being more crowded, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I would actually say because of more tourists, I wouldn't think that would limit them more. I think that would give them more reason to perform. Because, I mean, the tourists like seeing the music and, you know, the people who perform want to get as much money as they can. So I would say it kind of has the opposite effect, really. Any more questions? How much, if, say, you're good, um, what was the term you referred to street performance? Uh, buskers? Yes. Um, if you see like Abby the Spoon Lady who's pretty popular, she racks in a good amount of money. Like when you stand around her, you know, people are constantly putting donations in, so you probably get like 40 bucks if you're pretty good in an hour. Just my estimate. Alright, anything else? Alright, thanks. Good evening, I am Ashton Van Dyke. Um, my professor is Melanie McNair, and I wrote a papal, paper on hurdles that transgender people face in mental health and what we can do to help. And then I made a video presentation, and the format is based on ASAP Science videos. So just give me a second and I'll pull it up. Mental health is a universal issue, being a popular topic for music, film, and television. In fact, the World Health Organization labeled depression as the leading cause of disability worldwide. However, people from certain backgrounds are at a greater risk of experiencing mental health problems in their life. For example, a 2011 survey of 6,500 transgender and gender nonconforming people 
found that 41% had attempted suicide, as compared to 1.6% the general population. The same survey found that a quarter of the participants had abused alcohol and other drugs. Now, in an ideal world, these statistics shouldn't have to exist. Of course, an immutable and very human quality to not make anyone more predisposed to take their own life. If we want to strive for a better world, we first must find the roots of the problem. In a general sense, transphobia, or prejudice against transgender people, is the source of these proverbial roots. A study on transgender veterans found that transgender veterans living in states that lacked anti-discrimination laws and employment were 26% more likely to experience mood disorders and 43% more likely to self-harm than those living in states with those laws. Another study on transgender women found that, among this group, that there was a correlation between being a victim of physical violence and engaging in suicidal behaviors. There is also found to be a correlation between being a victim of sexual violence and engaging in substance abuse. This in itself is alarming, but it gets worse when you consider that transgender women are two to three times more likely to experience violence and discrimination than the rest of the population. So what can be done? Legislation can aid in minimizing the acts of discrimination that trans people face daily. One form of legislation that can be passed is anti-discrimination laws. Considering that, as of 2016, 32 states still lacked anti-discrimination laws for LGBT people. Some argue that anti-discrimination laws are ineffective and that they don't eliminate prejudice. Others argue that, in regard to employment, that if an employee or applicant were to sue, it might be difficult for them to prove that discrimination even happened. Obviously, passing anti-discrimination laws will not completely get rid of transphobia in our society and they are not necessarily an airtight guarantee that discrimination won't happen. However, they have been shown to influence the decision-making of employers. In 2009, researchers showed 255 human resource managers to applications and asked if they found one of the applications to be more favorable. One application would be from a man coded as LGBT. For example, the resume would say that he was awarded the Gay and Lesbian Alumni Scholarship from his school. The other resume gave similar qualifications, but was not coded as LGBT. About half of these managers lived in states with anti-discrimination laws for LGBT people, while the other half lived in states without these kinds of laws. HR managers who lived in states without anti-discrimination laws were less likely to evaluate the gay applicant as hireable, while HR managers living in states with anti-discrimination laws evaluated both resumes similarly. Passing anti-discrimination laws in housing and employment would certainly be a step in the right direction in reducing instances of transphobia and in improving the mental health of the trans community. However, we also need to consider laws regarding the change of gender markers on legal documents. A major factor in instances of anti-trans violence is that trans people are often barred from sex-segregated facilities such as homeless shelters, prisons, and rehab centers that correspond with their gender identity. Take into account the case of Dee Farmer, a transgender woman who was placed in a men's prison in the 90s and was subsequently raped and ended up contracting HIV. These types of facilities generally go off of what a person's legal gender is, with birth certificates being a common form of documentation. Amending birth certificates can be incredibly expensive. For example, in North Carolina, trans people are required to undergo sex reassignment surgery and have to have a doctor's note before they can legally change their gender marker. This is especially unfair to those who are at a lower income level, as transition-related surgeries are expensive and are not covered by most insurance companies. Also, some trans people might decide not to pursue surgery at all for personal or medical reasons. Though many trans people do end up pursuing some form of surgery, they shouldn't have to be required to have surgery in order to be safer from violence. 14 other states have laws similar to those in North Carolina, while 11 states lack explicit laws on amending birth certificates. Meanwhile, Tennessee law explicitly prohibits trans people from amending their birth certificate at all. Minimizing the requirements to amend birth certificates could potentially place trans people at a decreased risk of becoming victims of violence. For example, California 
law dictates that all someone would need to amend their birth certificate is a doctor's letter. Mental health both reflects on the condition of a population and contributes to it. The statistics on mental health in the trans population indicate a dire need for change. Laws might not eliminate prejudice from society, but legislation such as anti-discrimination laws and reform birth certificate laws would certainly be a step in the right direction. By doing our part in voting for pro-LGBT legislators, by contacting our local congressmen, and educating other voters, we can create a better tomorrow. Any questions? Yes. Um, I know that a lot of people have this idea that Asheville is a very like um, pro LGBTQ plus um, like city. Would you find that that is accurate in like the statistics of the treatment of trans individuals? Um. Yes, at least from being downtown and being here, I feel that it's a pretty LGBT friendly city. However. I can't really speak for all queer Asheville citizens, so F from my own personal experience, I feel like it's very accepting, but I can't speak for everyone. Yes? Um, when you're talking about how some individuals or most or people need a doctor's note before they can uh, change their gender, is that a doctor's note that needs to come from a physician or a psychiatrist? Um, it kind of varies. Usually it's from a psychiatrist, I believe. Yes? Um, at the beginning you were discussing how it was harder um, legally when, it discussion, like when you were discussing if discrimination occurred in cases dealing with it. What would be some better ways um, for the law to be adjusted to take this into account? Hmm. Better ways for the law to be adjusted. I'd have to do more research on that, honestly. <laughs> Thank you. So thanks to everyone for being here. Thank you so much. These were, these were wonderful. Can we give ourselves another round of applause? Yeah. These were pretty amazing. They really were. I love how different they all were and yet how engaging. And in case you didn't sign in, sign in and have a wonderful rest of your semester. Thank you so much for being here.